Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this special day. My name is Denise Tudor, and I am the medical reporter at Channel 7. You're joining us today for COVID-19 mass vaccination today and looking forward with the American Lung Association. Uh, with the reopening on, on June 15th here in California, there are a lot of questions of what we should do. And there's been a lot of confusion lately with mask wearing. Um, you know, California now talking about how we don't have to wear masks in indoor space. I mean, uh, the CDC saying we don't have to wear masks in indoor spacing, but in California says we do have to wear masks in indoor public spaces and what to do with schools. I know there's some controversy there. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, joining me is, uh, as you can see on the screen, is Dr. Albert Rizzo. He is the chief medical officer for the American Lung Association. And before we get to the questions, let me just go over what we're going to be talking about, give a little history of the Lung Association. Um, you know, as you know, the Delta variant is causing an uptick in cases. That's a big concern. Vaccination rates, uh, let me go over some of those in LA County because that is key to how we're gonna end this pandemic. In LA County, about 6 million people or roughly 59% of the total population uh, have been partially vaccinated as of five days ago. So that means 52% uh, are fully vaccinated. That's 5 million people. In total, the county has administered about 10 million doses in Orange County, nearly 2 million people, 1.9 million people, or 60% of the population. In Riverside County, 1.2 million people, or roughly 48%. In San Bernardino, 949,000 people, or 44%. So we have a lot of work to do in those counties. In Ventura County, 61% of the population where they have uh, 513,000 people fully or partially vaccinated as of five days ago. Uh, you know, the lung, American Lung Association has been around for 115 years. And when it started back then with four doctors who really wanted to crack the code of tuberculosis, something that has been the scourge of humanity for centuries and they decided they were going to use real science to figure this out and they did finding treatments finding a vaccine and here we are once again with COVID-19 on the brink of history and the American Lung Association is going to be another big part of this of this evolution getting the right answers and that's why we're here today uh, they have dedicated $25 million to ending the current pandemic and preventing future respiratory pandemic through the COVID-19 Action Initiative. As a trusted champion for lung health, the American Lung Association is focused on showing the spread and defeating COVID-19 to further protect the over overall population and those most vulnerable. And we need a high proportion of the population to get vaccinated. That's why I went through some of those numbers. We're going to address health disparities and offer reliable resources to all communities, especially underrepresented communities, which was cracked wide open because of this pandemic. We saw what the disparities were. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Rizzo, he plays a leading role in multiple areas of this mission and is responsible for ensuring that the American Lung Association is always using the best science and medicine to deliver on the mission for all Americans, from research uh, to health promotion, to communications, development, and advocacy. With his role as a leading medical spokesperson for the Lung Association, Dr. Rizzo is a trusted resource for the public, for the news media, and is frequently featured on national leading news outlets, including CNN, The New York Times, ABC News, The Today Show, and hundreds more. Now, throughout this, we are going to remind you that we need your help to make sure that the American Lung Association can continue with its mission. We'll try to get as many of you, we're going to take all your questions because that's why you're here. But we also need you to get involved, to volunteer, to support. Please feel free to write in the chat area uh, and we'll get back to you if you're willing to volunteer. And if you'd like to donate uh, to ensure these types of resources continue, please click on the link and get to the get in on the chat. And we look forward to hearing from you this this whole hour. And again, this is all for you. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. So Dr. Rizzo, uh, we are going to start with the questions that we have so far. And the question number one is, since we are 18 months into this pandemic, please review some of the basics of the coronavirus SARS COVID-2. Thank you, Denise, and thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to, since I've had some time to prepare for a few of these questions, I have some slides that I'm going to share with, uh, with us, and hopefully they'll come up without any problems here.
I think we're working on it here. Do you want to... There we go. So as you see in this slide, a number of viruses have been spilling over from animals to humans for quite a while now and continue to increase. Bats are the main reservoir and they're implicated in what we call these zoonotic situations. Uh, for some reason, the bats have adapted so that these viruses do really not affect the bats. The anti-inflammatory and the inflammatory issues that we see in our illnesses when we have viruses infect us do not seem to affect uh, the bats at all. So people with COVID-19 have had a wide range of symptoms over the past year and a half, uh, and they include mild to severe, usually start after two to 14 days, uh, the common ones have been fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, but there's a long list of things that can occur. Loss of taste or smell has been a common one associated with COVID-19, but interestingly, that doesn't seem to be one of the symptoms that certain variants have developed uh, cause, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So the list you see on, um, on this upcoming slide doesn't really list all the possibilities. What you also notice, however, is that we are aware now that there are multiple manifestations, not just the acute COVID-19 symptoms and illnesses. We're developing now uh, patients who are going on to have chronic symptoms. And we'll talk a little bit later on about what has been termed chronic COVID or long haulers disease, which is still something that is very much unknown as far as the specifics and who may be at risk for developing those particular issues. So Denise, do you have uh, the next question? Yes, yes. That's interesting to note about long hauler because, um, you know, tuberculosis had a similar uh, situation with it going to other parts of the body. So that that is an interesting analogy. Now, question number two, who is at high risk for COVID-19 infection and what symptoms might they present with? So in this slide from the beginning, we know that the CDC had listed uh, a fairly stable list of risk factors uh, since March of 2020. And it's been supported by many published articles over the past year. Certainly chronic diseases listed on the slide, chronic lung disease, heart disease, and the presence of certain immunocompromised states, either caused by the disease itself or medications that people take that affect their immune system, put them at risk. And there are several behavioral uh, issues that can put people at higher risk, particularly smoking and vaping. And when we say higher risk, this means people are more likely to develop an illness that may require hospitalization, intensive care unit, and sometimes death, as we saw too, all too often in uh, this past year and a half. Yes. If we yep. um, talk about children, we know that children are less affected by COVID-19 compared to adults. Um, and for some reason, again, we don't know all the answers, but some children do develop severe illness. Uh, there are medical conditions in children that put them at higher risk as compared to other children. These are particularly things such as the congenital heart diseases, the genetic and neurologic illnesses, and then some chronic lung diseases like asthma uh, or sickle cell disease also put individuals at risk. One thing to remember throughout this whole talk is one way to protect the young people around us and the unvaccinated around us is for the adults to get vaccinated so that they can be less likely to get the infection and transmit the disease. Oh, ready for the third question? Next question. Okay. It has been noted that the COVID-19 pandemic has shined a light on the already present disparities in healthcare that predated the pandemic. Can you please speak a little on that? Sure. So we know that anybody can be infected with COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic does not impact everyone equally. We also know that the pandemic exacerbated consequences of racial and socioeconomic disparities in health and health care across America. It was kind of a crisis within a crisis. While the terms equity and equality may sound similar, the implementation of one versus the other can lead to dramatically different outcomes for the marginalized population. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resource or opportunity. Equity, however, recognizes that each person has a different circumstance and needs to be allocated the exact resources and opportunities for them to reach their equal outcome. In the illustrations on this slide, individuals have unequal access to a system. In this case, the, the tree or the bicycle that provides uh, transportation or fruit uh, is shown on both uh, examples. With equal support, evenly distributed tools, the access to the fruit or the bike still remains unequal. The equitable situation, however, allocates the exact resource that each person needs 
in order to access the fruit or to use the transportation device in an equitable manner. Equity is a solution for addressing imbalances in the social systems. Justice can take equity one step further by fixing the systems in a way that leads to a long-term, sustainable, equitable access for generations to come. We also saw in the numbers that there was pronounced differences when we looked at illnesses and hospitalizations. For example, Michigan and Illinois, there were more than 40% of the deaths among African Americans, but they only made up about 14 to 15% of the state population. In Louisiana, African Americans represented 57% of the deaths, but accounted for only 33% of the state's population. You can see other disparities listed on this side. Uh, these outcomes are in large part the result of longstanding inequities in health determinants, which we include, which include limited access to health care, especially primary care, and limited access to affordable housing and fresh foods. These have led to high rates of chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, renal failure, and as you remember from the slide earlier I showed, these existing comorbidities put individuals at higher risk for the severe illness of COVID-19. Ready for the next question. All right, this next question. The CDC has said that vaccinated people could resume pre-pandemic activities. Are there some situations where mask wearing may still be recommended and why? Sure, so let's, uh, let's go back to a little bit of basic here first. Infections with respiratory viruses gets transmitted through three major modes, contact or what we call fomites surfaces, droplets and airborne. Now contact transmission infection spread through the direct contact of an infectious person touching another person, for example, the handshake, transmitting uh, the virus that way, either an article or a surface contact. Droplet transmission is an infection spread through exposure to the virus through what's called respiratory droplets, small and large, and exhaled by an infectious person. The transmission is most likely to occur when someone is close to the infectious person, uh, generally within about six feet, and that's where the social distancing number of six feet has come about. Airborne transmission tends to also imply that these are smaller particles that are spreading throughout the air. These particles contain the virus, and they are able to be suspended farther distances, usually greater than six feet, and can suspend in the air for longer periods of time because they are lighter. So that makes an important distinction about transmission via airborne versus contact. We know the principal mode of infection with SARS-CoV-2 is through exposure to these respiratory droplets. The respiratory droplets are exhaled, breathing, speaking, singing, coughing, sneezing, all of them expel respiratory droplets that can have the virus in them when an individual is infected. The larger droplets fall to the ground quickly within that six feet, the smaller droplets remain in the air. And once those droplets are exhaled, they move outward from that initial source, the concentration falls, but they're still gonna be diluted out by the air around them. And that's why it's important to take into account ventilation. When you're outdoors, it's much more likely that these particles get diluted by the volume of air outside. When you're indoors in a crowded space, that can make a difference if there's more particles to be inhaled. That's why there's been a, a mnemonic developed uh, over the past year and a half to help remember when's the highest likelihood of being infected by this airborne transmission. So if you avoid crowded indoor spaces where there's low ventilation, especially where there's proximity and long duration contact with other people who may be without masks when talking, yelling, or singing, that's the most likely time that you could get infected. So the mnemonic is civic duty that puts those letters into play. From the, stamp, from the start of the pandemic, we used the mitigating practices to decrease COVID-19, which included hand washing, social distancing, and then mask wearing became very important when this airborne transmission was recognized as the main route of spread. As I said before, this meant that uh, ventilation, size of rooms, number of people in a space also needed to take into account when considering the risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. The biggest step toward mitigating the spread, however, has been the development of the vaccines, which have been shown to be very effective in decreasing the risk of severe illness, hospitalization, and death. A statistic that I heard earlier this week to help support the importance and the effectiveness of the vaccines is that recently 99% of all COVID-related deaths have occurred in unvaccinated individuals. Again, 99% of the deaths have occurred in unvaccinated individuals. It's speaking to the efficacy of the vaccines. 
Now, having been vaccinated therefore really reduces your risk, doesn't make it zero, and will likely never become zero. But people who are vaccinated can still get infected and be asymptomatic or have mild disease and therefore spread it to unvaccinated individuals. That's why the recommendation is if you're unvaccinated, continue to wear a mask because you are not protected from individuals who may be unknowingly still carrying the disease, even though they are vaccinated. For this reason, there's been a lot of confusion about when to wear a mask and when not to wear a mask. And there are additional factors you need to take into account. The CDC did say that vaccinated people need not wear a mask when in public and can resume pre-pandemic activities unless other local regulations or restrictions are in place. As of today, that guidance has not been changed, but there's a lot of local regulations that have been put into place. And this has been brought about by enough for a number of reasons. We know that in areas where there's a larger number of unvaccinated individuals, especially if we now know these are areas where the Delta variant is more prevalent, we know that that particular variant can be more transmittable and it's going to infect more and more people who are unvaccinated. So if you're living in an area or dealing with an area that has high rate of unvaccinated individuals, high rate of the Delta variant, it would be prudent to wear a mask even in that situation, because you may become infected, not seriously, but you may become infected at the point that you can then carry that virus to other individuals in your household, maybe an unvaccinated child or an infant. So it's important to be aware of your surroundings geographically and what the prominent variant and unvaccinated rate in your areas are. And I think, you know, Denise showed that at the beginning, some of the rates around the area uh, that we're in. So some health experts say that wearing a mask in these areas uh, is still worthwhile. And, and remember, fully vaccinated means you need both doses of Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next question, Denise. Well, one follow up, Dr. Rizzo. So the CDC said it's OK for kids to be in classrooms without a mask. But in California, we're pushing back and we're not going to allow that. Is there evidence to show that that is a good move for California children? Well, uh, the key word there is evidence. Is there evidence? And sometimes we have to weigh the benefit and the risk of any recommendation. Certainly this past year and a half, we've erred on the side of the public health directives trying to mitigate the spread by cutting down the number of cases that are overwhelm the uh, healthcare system. We're now at a point where there's a larger number of people vaccinated, not certainly at herd immunity by any means, but we need to start realizing that the benefit of getting some of these kids back in school rather than remote learning uh, may start to outweigh the risk that can be involved with spreading the disease. Now, each school district has different resources to handle social distancing, masking, hand washing, things of that nature. So again, hard evidence is not available. We need to follow the recommended public health uh, criteria to help decrease the spread and just see how we do with the benefit for the children getting back in school. Always good to err on the side of caution. And before we right. proceed to the next question, we have a bit of uh, housekeeping to deal with. Sure. And with that, I'd like to bring in Maxine Tatlonghari with the American Lung Association. Maxine? Thanks, Denise. Hi, everybody. We are in a little bit of a technical difficulty. If you have questions, so we have a workaround for you. If you have any questions, please email greaterla at lung.org. Again, that's greater la at lung.org. You can also DM us questions on Instagram at California Lung. So either of those, we will get your questions. We did get a few of your questions ahead of time. And if you have anything else, we will also be following up with an email. Again, G-R-E-A-T-E-R-L-A -E at lung.org. Thanks for your patience. All right. Thank you, Maxine. The next question for Dr. Rizzo. Having dealt with COVID-19 for the past 18 months, what are some of the recommended therapies that have proven effective to some degree? So let me pull up uh, the right slide here. Okay. This is a very busy slide, but what, what the important thing is that there's two main processes that we know drive the, the pathogenesis of COVID-19. Early on in the clinical course, the disease is primarily driven by uh, the replication of the virus. Later in the clinical course, the disease is mainly driven by our own immune system that seems to be working over time or is dysregulated, and that leads to damage of our organs. So based on this understanding, it was anticipated and still is anticipated that antiviral therapies would have the best effect early on to actually fight the virus as it starts its uh, invasion of the body. While later on, immunosuppressive or anti-inflammatory therapies are likely to be more beneficial in those later stages. 
So far, there's no therapy that's been proven to be beneficial for outpatients who have the mild to moderate uh, disease. These are individuals that can be kept at home. They deal with the fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, but they don't have any issues with regard to dropping in oxygen levels. Uh, and these are the individuals that time will help uh, cure without any intervention. The more symptomatic an individual gets, especially if they're in a high risk group, such as those with chronic lung diseases or chronic heart diseases, they then are individuals where the uh, outpatient treatment with what's called monoclonal antibodies has been shown to be effective because this group could be kept out of the hospital if these monoclonal antibodies are initiated early on. However, once an individual is sick enough to require supplemental oxygen and administered to the hospital, then the antiviral remdesivir is often recommended. Right now, remdesivir is the only antiviral agent that's approved by the FDA for treatment of COVID-19. It's recommended for those hospitalized who require oxygen and hopefully early on. It doesn't seem to be as beneficial once patients have reached the point of needing to be on a ventilator. The other important anti-inflammatory drug that's been used over the past year and a half are the steroids, dexamethasone being the main name that people may recognize. This is added during a patient's hospital stay to help control the inflammation and bring the uh, inflammation under control so it doesn't damage the body organs. Another drug that is sometimes used in this situation is called tocilizumab, and that is also what's called an anti-interleukin antibody, which affects the inflammatory system in the body and slows it down. Oh, really? yeah. I think we're ready for the next question. That was pretty thorough going through every treatment. The next question we have is, how do the current vaccines work? Let's see if I can pull up a slide for that here. Oh, there we go. So while all the uh, COVID-19 vaccines authorized in the country uh, offer su substantial protection, we know that because uh, of the efficacy of the vaccine, they're all slightly different to some degree. Now the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines have been listed as about 95% effective in preventing severe illness. Doesn't mean you still can't get infected, but the symptoms would be minimal or asymptomatic. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was reported about 85% effective. Again, for the same reason, to prevent severe disease. And these are all based on where they were tested. Certain variants were prominent in some areas, the United States, South Africa, Brazil. So you see differences among the vaccines for those reasons. There's really no head-to-head -head comparison to say one vaccine is better than the other. And the recommendation at the beginning and still is, if you have access to a vaccine, get it. Don't wait for one particular one. So even though those numbers vary, it's important to remember that. Now, the Johnson & Johnson uh, clinical trials took place uh, months after the others, and sometimes the variants that were available for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine were slightly different than what the Pfizer and Moderna clinical trials showed. That also leads to why there's differences in these numbers. Okay. Uh, the two vaccine types, the Moderna and the Pfizer, were considered mRNA. And what that meant was that a segment of the mRNA, the message that's contained in the genetic code of the virus, was man-made and put into the vaccine and then injected into the arm. That man-made genetic code was then recognized by the body and an antibody was made to that genetic code, which actually was the spike protein of the coronavirus. That's the protein that attaches to the cells in our airways. So by making that antibody, it was allowing the uh, vaccine to create antibodies to the virus and keep it from attaching at that spike protein. No live virus was involved with any of this vaccine, so therefore it could not transmit COVID-19, which has been a misinformation among many people who are hesitant to get the vaccine. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, slightly different, that used what's called a vector virus. A very innocuous, innocent virus was given a mRNA type of genetic code and was administered to us, and that virus carried that a genetic code into the body and again made antibodies against that particular spike protein. Neither one of these, whether Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer or, bio, or um, Moderna, have any viral components and therefore cannot transmit the disease. Okay. Let me see okay. if it's another slide that might be, uh, yeah, so while we all agree that uh, we like to return to pre-pandemic normal levels, the unwillingness of many to get the vaccine is causing researchers to believe that hesitancy is going to prevent us from reaching herd immunity. Uh, recent nationwide surveys have shown that uh, their COVID-19 vac vaccine hesitancy is due to a lot of reasons, uh, possible side effects, 
Uh, some people mistrusting the fact that this was developed in a very short period of time and may have not worked out all the kinks. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about um, conspiracy theories about chips being in here, people becoming magnetized. Uh, there's a lot of concerns over side effects. The side effects that do get reported to the FDA have been very, very small in number when you compare to the millions of people who are getting the vaccines. And the message now is to make sure we get true information to individuals who are hesitant, but not just a message from me or the government, uh, but people who are in that community, community volunteers, friends, neighbors, clergy, people who trust individuals in that community to help them realize that getting the vaccine is going to make a difference. Uh, and, and that's the only way we're going to be able to try to get to herd immunity. Next question, Denise. Well, a follow up to that, it definitely gives you peace of mind. I'm vaccinated. All my children are vaccinated, um, but there's a lot of for people who are interested in the vaccine. There's a lot of question about boosters. Uh, if you have a Johnson and Johnson vaccine, should you get the booster? Should the government allow Pfizer to create an mRNA booster? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the booster, uh, we've heard a lot about the Pfizer booster. Pfizer is probably the farthest along in doing the clinical trials with uh, the boosters. Uh, and they have data that they feel is making it readily available to start recommending boosters. From the start, uh, the concern was that the booster, the uh, vaccines originally would last about six to 12 months. And if we recall, we're probably just about at that six month interval for many people who got the vaccine early on. And I think the FDA is waiting to get a little more clinical information to see whether or not recommending that booster is going to be better done later this year rather than trying to jump to it right now. I can't stress how important it is for everybody to get that first series of vaccinations done. That's the key thing. Uh, muddying the waters by people struggling to get boosters at this point in time or setting up clinics for boosters may not be the right approach to really getting her immunity reached. So I think keep tuned, keep in tune, but I think boosters will be needed, but not yet. Okay. All right. Next question. Why should we be concerned about hearing of the different variants that are being identified? Sure. So the viruses constantly change, including the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the genetic variations occur over time, and they lead to a lot of different mutations and variants that have different characteristics. The slide I've shown here uh, shows the current variants of concern. And the CDC lists variants as either variants of interest, meaning that they've seen them in the community, or variants of concern. And the concern means that these are the ones that are causing the disease and increasing the number of cases. So the, the, the genetic uh, coding of each of these viruses is slightly different and can lead to a virus becoming more likely to be infectious or attached to that spike protein that I mentioned early on. And right now, the Delta variant, which has become the most prominent variant in this country, is felt to be more easily transmittable. The good part about all this is that all the variants to date still seem to be um, under control with the current vaccines. The reason it's so important to try to get to herd immunity is that Delta variant's not going to be the last one. There's already something called the Lambda variant that is popping up in about 25 to 30 countries across the world. We're not sure if that's going to be more infectious or not. But until we can get a handle on this coronavirus stopping to grow, stopping to mutate, we're going to keep seeing variants that can become more and more lethal. So herd immunity means that the ability for that virus to replicate un uncontrolled and lead to more variants will be curtailed. So I hate to keep harping on it, but getting vaccinated is the important thing. I don't think you can mention that enough for sure. Um, we are definitely getting a lot of questions, uh, people emailing them in. Um, we're going to get right to them. And this okay. last question that was submitted earlier, what do we know about the chronic COVID patients that are sometimes referred to as long haulers? Right, right. Yeah, about 10 months into the pandemic, we started seeing the emergence of this uh, uh, chronic symptoms, patients who not only were in the intensive care unit and needed a fair amount of time to recover from their severe illness, but even people who didn't even be hospitalized but had shortness of breath that persisted, along with other symptoms that included uh, fatigue, brain fog, muscle aches and pains, arthralgias. Uh, that has become a growing number of individuals that are being seen now in many centers that have popped up across the country called post-COVID recovery clinics or long hauler clinics. These patients are very similar to what we know as uh, chronic uh, myalgia syndromes or chronic fatigue syndromes. Uh, they often do best with multidisciplinary approach, lung doctors, heart doctors, um, uh, psychologists, 
uh, neurologist because it is a multi system uh, event that occurs. We don't have answers yet. The NIH has uh, in place several studies already. They're going to look at the characteristics of these individuals and try to determine who's at risk and what if Eddie's going to be a specific treatment for these individuals. Yeah. And the scary thing about this is you don't even have to have a severe case of COVID to have That's a long correct. hauler symptom. That's correct. That's correct. That That is very scary. All right. And um, OK, so we have more questions coming in. This one from somebody watching right now. What are your thoughts, Dr. Rizzo, about summer travel and flying? Well, we go back to the old benefit and risk. Uh, certainly flying right now, you still required to wear uh, face mask in airports and in in, um, in the airplanes. Mentioned that early on, ventilation played a big role with regard to the degree of transmission. Airlines are one of the places where there's significantly improved ventilation, air exchange that occurs. So that's a good point. Uh, the, the bad point is you're in a confined space with a lot of other individuals. You really don't have any control over whether or not those individuals are vaccinated or unvaccinated. Everybody's wearing a mask, that's true. But I would say right now that if you're in a high risk group, immunocompromised, chronic lung disease, my feeling would be traveling needs to be for good reason, not just to necessarily break away and have a good time, but maybe to visit family you have not seen in a long time, visit a new child. Um, so it, it's going to be a matter of weighing individual risks for your particular situation. And you get to talk to your doctor and help him give you that benefit risk ratio. That's good advice. And it also matters where you visit because you might be visiting a part of the country where vaccination rates are very low and cases are high. Exactly. The Delta variant may be present. You're right. All right. Um, someone uh, listening would like you to revisit your answer about vaccines and school age children. Well, right now the vaccines are approved down to age 12 uh, and several of the companies are looking to get it down even lower. Uh, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if there's background noise. I'm in my office and there are other people here, so hopefully you can still hear me well. Um, the, the reason about the school is that you still have to follow the other mitigating uh, circumstances, hand washing, social distancing, maybe having uh, screens between desks and wearing masks. So it would be ideal if we could get everybody in school vaccinated. We right now don't have the approval of vaccines below the age of 12, uh, and we're hoping that that happens sometime later this year. So I'm not sure if I can answer it any more specifically than that is it goes back to how important it is to get back into school for these children who've had really a change in the way they learn over the past year and a half versus the potential risk of COVID. Remember, children are not getting a severe disease early on, as far as we know. Will a new variant change that? We don't know yet. Yes, I am. that's what they say. The science is evolving. The recommendations will change. Right. So. Right. Uh, there is a here's a new question. Working out is so important to Californians. What are your recommendations on going back to the gym? Um, again, I think look at the gym you're going to. Are they following certain rec regulations? Did they improve their ventilation? Did they space out their machines? Are they requiring masks? Um, are they clean places? I mean, all of this really, I hate to say, comes down to a lot of common sense about what's the right thing to do in a situation where we know a virus can be transmitted by speaking and talking. Uh, and if you're unvaccinated, that risk is even higher. So um, again, look at your gym and decide to go back. Now, the other option is do what you've been doing the past year and a half. And a lot of us have not been working out the way we wanted to. Try to find alternatives. So work out at home a little bit more. Be more disciplined with that before going back to the gym. Many times gyms were social places, and that'd be nice if we can get back to that. But uh, the working out is, is more important at this point uh, and safer than trying to go back to a place where there may be more viral transmission. It's practical advice. We definitely have to be more disciplined when we're at home like this. Patricia has this question. Why aren't tests for antibodies being widely used before vaccinating? Before vaccinating? Well, we know that people who got the natural infection, uh, many of them did develop antibodies. What we don't know for sure is how well those antibodies hold up over time compared to what the vaccine does. Uh, early on, individuals were told that they probably should not get vaccinated for several months after they had their COVID because we didn't know how the reaction of the vaccine-related antibodies with the natural infection would occur. That's really not panned out as to be a concern. The biggest concern is that natural infection wanes probably quicker than the vaccine effect does. So uh, 
people who have had COVID-19 should get vaccinated. The antibodies also don't tell us the whole story about whether or not a high level of antibody is going to protect you for three months, six months, or a year. Uh, and uh, measuring antibodies can also vary from institution labs that are done with one lab versus another lab. Uh, and everybody has the ability to create antibodies differently with regard to a natural infection. So pre-vaccine antibodies aren't going to tell you not to get vaccinated at this point in time. We just don't have that science. Absolutely, and that reminds me of a journal Nature study that came out earlier this month about how the mRNA vaccines create something called germinal cells that are in our lymph nodes. And when you were talking about the other parts of immunity that are probably more important than antibodies because these germinal cells are the brains to tell the body to create antibodies. And so we have evidence that, that these vaccines, at least the mRNA ones, may last longer than we suspected. Right. Yeah, with vaccines, we often talk about the, the antibodies that are produced and what's called the B-cell antibodies. We forget that the T-cell, which is the other important arm of the immune system, also plays a role in preventing infection. And that's the part that's not easily measured, but we know that it occurs more, more significantly with the vaccines than with the natural infection. Right. Thank you so much. So it's it's important for us. We're all learning here in the public, right? right. All right. these things Every that you day. doctors know. And we have, so you're learning, we're learning. Uh, well, here's a new question. We heard that elevators were one of the most dangerous places to be a year ago. Has that changed? I know I kind of look around when I have to go into an elevator to make sure it's not crowded. Yeah. Uh, small confined space and uh, ventilation in elevators. Rarely do you see a lot of ventilation going on in those areas. So uh, it, it goes to the same questions we had about the airplane. You look at the who, who around you, how big is the airspace, what's the ventilation like, and you can't tell if somebody's unvaccinated or not around you. So be cautious in any space you're in. If you're at risk, immunocompromised, wear a mask in any places where you feel uncertain. I guess it has a lot to do with the viral load in the air as well. I mean, because we don't know what the filtration is. So if there's exactly. a bunch of people and they're coughing, then you're more yep. likely to be coughing, infected. Coughing, sneezing, yelling, singing. <laughs> yes. Those things. Even just breathing exhales droplets. See, there um, you go. I remember that I've, singing I've story. I've known some people who would get on an elevator, they'd hold their breath if they could for the flight, <laughs> for the uh, elevation to their floor. <laughs> Does that help holding your no, breath? No. <laughs> it made them feel better. It made them feel better, but <laughs> right. All right. That's good to know because I know a lot of people who do that too. All right. Here is a question from Laura Lee in San Diego. Are there any additional vaccine concerns or considerations for patients with blood disorders such as polycythemia? Yeah, we're we're certainly the FDA is monitoring any uh, side effects that get reported to them. And so far, all the side effects, whether they include the blood clots, the myocarditis that we're seeing in some children, these are all things that the COVID virus can also cause. And the feeling is that the risk of getting it from the COVID-19 infection remains higher than the risk of getting it from one of the vaccines. You have to remember that when a re reported uh, side effect occurs, it's occurring in usually what's called hundreds of patients as compared to the millions who got the vaccine without any consequences. Earlier today, I saw a report that the Guillain-Barre syndrome was isolated or noted among some people with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Guillain-Barre was one of the uh, side effects that occurred back in uh, the swine flu epidemic back in the 80s, and a lot of people developed this neurologic disorder. It occurs after any viral infection. It's just something that occurs not too commonly, and to notice it, it among, again, 30 to 40 individuals when millions have been vaccinated, it's something to watch but it's certainly not something to say, don't get vaccinated. Or it's not something to say, take this vaccine off the market. Now, the FDA has given these vaccines some emergency use approval, and they will change that if they see enough evidence that more harm is being caused than benefit. To this point, the benefit far outweighs the harm. Right. All the experts say these are very rare events, and the benefits definitely outweigh the risks. Um, but I had, a, I had a question about that. So... Guillain-Barre, as you mentioned, is something that you see with, you said, uh, Johnson & Johnson, because the FDA is about to issue that warning, or maybe they just did. And um, they also said they saw it with AstraZeneca. And then they also had the severe, the, the very, um, the few cases of blood clots as well, those rare blood clots. Right. Why do those happen in those vaccines and not with the mRNA vaccine? Big, big area of research. 
Uh, we know, as I mentioned earlier, the back seats are slightly different as to how they're prepared, what's used, and what may trigger a certain individual to develop uh, a reaction. The blood clots, for example, turned out to be related to an antibody that was created that affected the, pla the platelets in the body and led to clotting. Uh, why certain individuals developed that, we still don't know. That's still being studied. Uh, but again, it was rare. Uh, it was something that had to be recognized, not because just to recognize it, but it needed to be treated differently than some typical blood clots would occur. Uh, typical blood clots that occur in the legs or the lungs are often treated with what's called anticoagulants, heparin, warfarin. These clots that were occurring were slightly different and needed to be treated with what's called direct thrombin uh, antagonists. So it, it's important for science to figure out not just what occurred, but why it occurred and what's the best way to treat it. So more information again is needed. And that's interesting to know. And again, we want to remind everyone these are very rare events and not all of them, they're sure, are related to the vaccine. Um, but what about heart inflammation and the mRNA vaccines? Why does that occur with those types of vaccines? Again, you're asking, and my, my stock answer is going to be here, we just don't know yet. We know that the myocarditis has been reported uh, occurring in some individuals. Uh, cardiomyopathy. But if we go back and listen to what happened with COVID-19, we know COVID can cause cardiomyopathy. We know it can cause pericarditis, myocarditis. So the virus is causing problems in our body because of the immune system being awakened as it fights the virus. Now, the immune system sometimes doesn't regulate itself as well as it should. We have a lot, a lot of autoimmune diseases that have predated COVID, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. These are uh, diseases related to abnormal immune responses to our own body. And what a virus does, like COVID has done, that inflammation is geared up and sometimes it does more than it's supposed to. It's just not as good a control as we would like it to be. Um, the drugs that I mentioned early on are used to help slow down that over-inflammatory response that can be triggered. And that sometimes has prevented many people from developing some of the severe consequences of the COVID infection, like the myocarditis and the clots. All right. It's good that you're explaining this. And again, we just have to remind everyone that these are very rare and the benefits are definitely there. I mean, you don't want COVID because COVID causes all those things as well. Um, let's see. What is the light? Here's a new question from Deb. What is the likely lag time months, the number of months between the time when we realize that a new variant is resistant to the current vaccines and the development and distribution availability of a new vaccine? Well, the, the, the knowledge that a new variant is out there is really dependent on the amount of what's called genetic code testing that gets done in different parts of the country. And these are done by public health systems. So not everybody who gets their virus will have that virus tested for a genetic code. When there are starting to be increased numbers of cases in a particular area, that's a signal that we need to look at that virus and find out has the genetic code changed. That's why the Delta variant was picked up. That's why the Lambda variant is being picked up. So once we find out that there's a new variant out there, we now have to start looking in other places where we start to see that uh, population of, of cases increase. We then have to determine, is this occurring at a greater rate than we saw before, which might mean that the virus is more transmittable? And are we also seeing more severe illness and more death than we did before? That might mean the new variant is more lethal. So a lot of it has to be doing it in retrospect. You see a change in the course of events, you identify a new variant, and you see what happens next. More transmission, more lethality, and that helps you decide what you need to do. As I said it before, that will always keep going until we get to herd immunity. More variants will develop until herd immunity is reached. All right. We're hoping we get the message out here with this forum that we're presenting today. Earlier, I mentioned that the Lung Association has dedicated $25 million to ending this pandemic and preventing future respiratory pandemics with this COVID-19 action initiative. Can you tell me more about this initiative? Yeah, the initiative really spans across uh, research for sure, but also health promotions and education, as well as advocating for things like equal access to to what needed to be done to treat these patients. Uh, the research in particular uh, is part of what we do as part of our COVID research grants. We've had over 300 individuals, researchers, apply to us with their ideas about how to combat uh, COVID, everything from public health measures to antiviral therapies. And we've supported many of those researchers. We're also in discussions with uh, NHLBI, part of NIH, about helping to support two particular 
uh, studies that are looking at the effects of patients who had COVID in the hospital, survived the ICU, and now are in that six to eight month phase outside of the ICU, where some of them now are going to that long haul type of system sy syndrome. Uh, so we're, we're trying to approach this and help research dollars, both in the acute setting and new discovery of, of treatments, as well as looking at ways to define how we can treat the new group of chronic lung conditions called post-COVID. Did the Lung Association feel this was an important call to action because in the beginning we all thought it was a lung disease? Well, I think that we still feel this a respiratory pathogen. I mean, the main way the coronavirus causes disease is we, it's inhaled into our system. So it starts as a respiratory pathogen. Uh, our concern is that there's going to be other respiratory pathogens. So the COVID-19 action initiative was not just to fight COVID-19, but also other emerging respiratory pathogens that we know unfortunately will occur uh, down the line. And we have to be better prepared and get the science uh, buffed up so that we don't have the delays in what we saw this past year and a half. As amazingly as the vaccine development was, it'd be nice if we could do it even quicker next time around if need be. It really would be. Just want to remind everyone we have about 10 minutes now to get all of your questions in. So please email uh, any questions that you have for Dr. Rizzo. This seems like a good time to remind everyone that if you want to get involved uh, with this initiative and the American Lung Association, if you want to volunteer or support, feel free to write in um, and we'll get back to you. And if you'd like to donate to ensure that these types of resources continue, please click on the link. Um, I'm not sure if it's available in the in the chat but you know you can go to the American Lung Association to their website and you can donate there. Find out more about how to become a volunteer and um, definitely we, we they have resources for any issues that you also have or any questions that you have. So they're here to answer your questions but they also would love your help and now is a good time to get involved. So we have, it's, uh, we have about 13 minutes left in the program. Let me see. Oh, we also also email it, which is that's a note. <laughs> also email in if you're willing to help out. Again, Rizzo, Dr. Dr. Rizzo, thank you for your expertise. I have definitely learned a lot. Okay. Uh, this one came in. I heard the blood clots were related to women on the birth control pill. Is this true? And if so, will this affect pregnancy or anything in the future? Blood clots related to being on birth control pills. Um, even without COVID, we know that that's a risk factor for clotting, birth control pills in young women. The type of clot that that would lead to is often called a deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. That is a little bit different from the clots that are occurring as a result of the um, vaccines. That's why I mentioned they're treated in different ways. I mean, the cavernous sinus thrombosis that occurs in the head as part of the uh, syndrome with the vaccines is different from the clots that are caused by being on hormones. Now, if you're on hormones as well as getting a vaccine, could it multiply your risk of, of uh, clotting problems? It could. Again, the risk of that is much less than the risk of what COVID-19 could do to you if you got infected. To date, there's no evidence that any vaccine has affected the reproductive capabilities of, of women. Every OBGYN that I know has always recommended that their patients get the vaccine, even if they're pregnant, because again, the sickness with COVID-19 can be more detrimental uh, than the, any potential side effect from the vaccine because of the rarity of it. All right, well, Dr. Rizzo, you've addressed everything from the beginnings of this pandemic to where we are today. Do you have any closing thoughts? Um, if I said get vaccinated, would that be redundant? <laughs> <laughs> not at all, because people are not, not yeah. everyone's getting the message. And, and I think we have to realize that it's gonna take sitting down with a, a person and explaining to it, Primary care doctors are still one of the most trusted people that patients uh, have. So they need to have that discussion with their doctors, talk to their clergy, friends and family who've been vaccinated. And certainly the Lung Association, NIH, and the government will continue to put out the best science we can, but people need to be convinced by people they trust in their communities as well. Right, and now is the time for all of us to walk with our loved ones and our friends and explain to them our experiences with the vaccine. And hopefully they will trust us and, and want to come to the other side. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Rizzo. Um, but right now, um, just hang in there. I'm going to toss it to Maxine, who has some closing thoughts for us. 
Everybody, I want to thank you for taking the time during your lunch to join us. We were thrilled to have two experts like Denise and Dr. Rizzo joining us to really answer questions for both laymen and professionals. So we really appreciate that. This is the first in our series of four. Next week, we will be talking about youth and nicotine, and then we will be talking with Cedar Sinai about lung transportation on the 27th. And on August 3rd, we will be talking about EV and the environment. So all things lung health, please mark your calendars. We want to thank you again for your time and thank Denise and Dr. Rizzo again for being so candid and being experts to help us um, as we navigate these final stages of COVID. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we will see the other side thank of it you. very shortly. <laughs> Have a great yeah. afternoon, everybody. You All too. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thanks, Dr. Rizzo.